Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. Luke chapter 19, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem as we continue with the chapter-by-chapter study of the Gospel of Luke. Looking at Jesus as the Son of Man, Luke being a Gentile, writing primarily to Gentiles, and so that includes most of the people in this audience, people who were not Jewish or Gentiles. And so Luke is giving his perspective and emphasizing the universal mission and purpose of God in Christ to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's exactly what we will what we will look at here in Luke 19 as we divide this chapter up into four sections. First, Zacchaeus meets Jesus. Secondly, the profitable versus the unprofitable servant. Some Bibles call this the parable of the minas. Um, so we'll talk about that secondly. Third, the triumphal entry. And this is where Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the final week of his earthly ministry before he is crucified. And then the cleansing of the temple is how Luke 19 ends. So we are transitioning now into the final days, the final week of Jesus' ministry. And... um So everything has been building up to this point and the confrontation between Jesus and the religious leadership is about to be fully exposed here. Again, recall uh, from the previous teachings that uh, Jesus visited Jerusalem, but most of his life and ministry were were spent outside of Jerusalem in Galilee, uh, raised in Nazareth. His, His ministry was mostly in Galilee to the north of Judea and Jerusalem. And so this chapter culminates with Jesus entering into Jerusalem for what will be the last time in his public ministry, because these are the events leading up to his crucifixion. So this is what will occupy us for the next few chapters as we continue on with Luke. Right now, he is still on the way to Jerusalem here. In Luke chapter 19, verse 1, we meet Zacchaeus. So, uh, reading there, Luke 19, 1, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So he's on the way to Jerusalem. He's passing through Jericho, and it says, Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. <laughs> Uh, Verse 8, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I really love that. That's one of my favorite passages uh, there, one of my favorite stories, and then one of the favorite passages because it reiterates this idea, and I think it's probably the main theme that Luke really wants to get across, is that the Son of Man, Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's not just saving them. He is seeking them. He's seeking them out. He's not sitting back waiting to see if anyone is going to accept him or not, waiting to see if someone might pray the sinner's prayer today, giving us all the control, giving us all the freedom, and whenever we get around to it, and whenever we feel like it, we can 
give him permission to come into our heart and save us. No, this is a proactive Savior that God sent into the world. He says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So he's more than just a Savior. He's seeking and saving that which is lost. So, again, we reiterate it through through this story, and this is what Luke wishes to illustrate, how Jesus, the Son of Man, is the Savior of all, and not just the Savior of some, and specifically, in this context, he's not just the Savior of good people. He's not come to call the righteous, he says, but sinners to repentance. And also in this context, he is the Savior of all, not just the Savior of the Jews, Not just the Savior of those good Jews versus the bad Jews. Not just the Savior of good people compared to tax collectors. And this one is a chief tax collector. So he's he's really, really on the bottom of the list, socially speaking. You'll recall from previous chapters, Luke is always talking about these tax collectors They were Jewish employees of Rome who were to go out and collect taxes from their fellow Jews. That was bad enough, but part of their compensation was they got to keep whatever extra they could collect over and above what they were required to collect. And so as a result, these tax collectors became very rich and had lots of power, and for that reason, they for those reasons, they were despised by the people. Now, here is Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, and he has made himself rich off of his bro- off of his brethren, off of his countrymen, uh, by collect- collecting taxes for Rome. So, um, this is someone, and. Um, It's very plain here from the context that the people resented this man and resented the fact that Jesus would associate with him. He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner, it says, and they all complained in verse 7. And they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, as the Savior of all, not just the Savior of some, of course Jesus is going to associate and fellowship with people that the world would consider sinners. Uh, but there's there's something more to the Lord Jesus than what we realize. As the Savior of all, Jesus is concerned with the good and with the bad. Jesus is concerned for and cares about the righteous as well as the unrighteous. He loves them all the same, and especially those that we consider too difficult to deal with. The ones that we consider consider sinners, lost, unsaved, worldly, These are especially the ones that seem receptive to Jesus, whereas it is the religious hypocrites that seem to give Jesus most of the problems. So this is part of the the offense that Jesus creates by associating with people that the religious system wants nothing to do with. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, and he has gotten rich through his ill-gotten collections, and However, something about Jesus has touched Zacchaeus. We don't know what's going on in his heart. And there's a lesson right there. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Don't critique. Love them all and let God sort them out because you have no idea what God is doing in someone's heart. You don't know what's going on. You don't know how the Holy Spirit is dealing with them. And... We do know that something was going on with Zacchaeus because he tried to see Jesus. And the King James Version says that he could not because of the press. 
I've got an article on my website called Beat the Press. <laughs> and it's talking about how Zacchaeus uh, persisted. We, talk about, we talked about persistence last time. Zacchaeus persisted. Whereas a lot of people, they might give up. Um, Zacchaeus, he could not see Jesus because of the press. He went and found a tree and, and climbed up the tree so that he could see Jesus passing by. And there was something about Jesus that touched Zacchaeus enough for him to do that, just to get a glimpse of Jesus. But Jesus also must have perceived something in Zacchaeus. He must have seen, known, because he searches the hearts and he knows the the hearts. He knows what is in the hearts and the minds of people. And Jesus must have perceived that Zacchaeus had repented. Now, there's no sinner's prayer here. There's no, there's nothing that suggests that there was even a conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus. You know, contrast this with the rich young ruler. Contrast Zacchaeus' willingness to to come to Jesus and depart with his wealth compared with the rich young ruler's unwillingness to do what Jesus asked. Well, the rich young ruler sought Jesus out just the way Zacchaeus did, but he came. Uh, the rich young ruler came to Jesus with a religious question: "Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life?" Zacchaeus, it doesn't show that he that he had any kind of a conversation with Jesus, didn't ask him anything. He, he was just wanting to see him. But there was something about his heart and his behavior that Jesus must have perceived that he had repented. He had had a change of heart and a change of mind that would lead to a change of behavior. And so Jesus... Because he is seeking and saving the lost. He's not waiting for Zacchaeus to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or, Jesus, I accept you as my personal savior now. Now Jesus sees Zacchaeus and and Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. He says, make haste and come down, Zacchaeus, for today I must stay at your house. And says they all complained once again because here's Jesus supposed to be a rabbi, supposed to be holy than everyone else, holier than everyone else. And here he is fellowshipping with a sinner, and not just any sinner, but old Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, the, the big old sinner. And here is Jesus inviting himself to Zacchaeus's house. But see, the interesting thing is that Jesus perceived something that no one else perceived. He understood Zacchaeus without a word. And so he, he, it says Zacchaeus made haste. He came down from the tree. He received him joyfully. Everyone's complaining about Zacchaeus and complaining about Jesus. And they just kind of tune everybody out and they go have this celebration. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord in verse eight, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. This is huge. He's probably not going to have any money left by the time he pays back fourfold everything that he has over collected and then gives half of what he has to start with to the poor. So he's got a lot of money. But he's not going to have a lot after he goes back and repays everybody fourfold. But this just really confirms what Jesus perceived without a word that Zacchaeus had had a change of heart and that Zacchaeus had repented. How would you know that? You wouldn't know that. Only Jesus could know the heart. He knows the heart. And... He saw that something had changed in Zacchaeus, and so he focused in on Zacchaeus, and he says that today salvation has come to this house. So basically, Jesus is saying, hey, Zacchaeus is not a sinner anymore. (laughs) How's that? Well, because his behavior 
demonstrates his repentance. He's changed his heart. He's changed his mind. And assuming, and there's no reason uh, that we wouldn't assume, assuming he follows through with what he says he's going to do, Jesus is rejoicing. This is, this is, this is good news. Salvation has come to this house today. Everyone else is complaining. Jesus is rejoicing. Why, he says, because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And this goes back again to that parable that we studied a few chapters ago, where it says that the good shepherd, even though he, even though he has 99 sheep, if he loses one, he leaves the 99 behind and he goes in search of the one. And when he finds that one that is lost, he brings it home again rejoicing. And in the same way, he says, heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents compared to 99, 99 people who do not need repentance. So this is what Jesus is all about, to seek and to save that which is lost. And so in this case, he is successful. Now that is going to, to stand in stark contrast to how the rest of the people in Jerusalem would receive him a little bit later on. But all of this is instructive as Jesus is moving closer and closer to Jerusalem. We come to the second section, the profitable versus the unprofitable servants. In verse 11, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So the, the purpose of the parable that Jesus is about to tell them, it, it comes right out and, and tells you why he gave them this parable. It's to correct a couple of misunderstandings. And one is that the kingdom was a political revolution. And the second was that the kingdom was about to appear or that it would appear immediately. So they figured he was going to Jerusalem to claim the throne of his ancestor David. Jesus as the son of David, he would assume the kingship of Israel and would lead them, lead Israel uh, to declare independence from the Romans, to lead them in battle and, uh, and win a great victory over their enemies. So realizing this, it says he spoke another parable to them because he was near Jerusalem. And because they thought, since he's heading towards Jerusalem, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So there's a couple of misunderstandings. One, what is the kingdom of God? They misunderstood that. And secondly, they misunderstood when it was to arrive. So he gives them this parable in verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded the servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much each man had gained by trading. Now, I should mention here that a mina, M-I-N-A, it's just a measurement of money. Um, it is worth, according to this footnote in my Bible, it says that one mina is worth about three months' salary, uh, whatever that means. It, it's it's a good amount of money. I guess three months' salary, regardless of the of the period of time, that's that's a lot of money, regardless of the currency. So it's three months' salary, and that's just one. So it says that that he he divided these minas this money up among his various servants. In verse 16, then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. Wow. That's what, like a thousand percent return. He started out with one, he earned 10 more. 
And so verse 17, he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the miner from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. It's like, he's already got ten. Why you? Why give him more? Verse 26, For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. <laughs> so this is a powerful, powerful parable, right? And so Jesus is, is giving them this parable again with, with any parable, you don't want to get lost in the details. So don't go, don't go too far off the track and get lost in the weeds you know, trying to understand every single detail. The point of the parable, generally speaking, is to communicate to them that the kingdom of God is not going to appear immediately. And the fact that he is going to Jerusalem has nothing to do with it being a political kingdom at all. Actually, the kingdom of God, according to these parables that we've been studying and according to what we know from Scripture, what Jesus has taught, the kingdom of God is a spiritual revolution, not a political revolution. And secondly, the kingdom of God, technically speaking, it's not coming. It would not appear immediately the way that they imagine or even the way that you and, and I would imagine. Most people think of the kingdom of God appearing when Jesus returns, his second coming. And in in a way, um, that's true, but it's also true that we can look forward to the second coming the same way these disciples looked forward to Jesus going to Jerusalem, assuming that would be the beginning of some great um, revolution but the point is that the kingdom of God is already happening. Why? Because Jesus says, my mission is to seek and to save the lost. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. We learned in Luke four, he's sharing his mission that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And so certainly there is a, a, a finale, a culmination, a, a fulfillment in the future. But they were so focused on the political side of it, they missed the spiritual side, and they also missed the fact that the kingdom was already there. Jesus is the kingdom, and the kingdom is Jesus, because Jesus is seeking and saving the lost, and even now he is on his way to Jerusalem to prophetically, symbolically, but also to literally offer himself prophetically as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. So Jesus is going about this spiritual revolution, building a, a kingdom of God, setting the captives free, casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead. And so that indicates that the kingdom of God in some measure had already begun to be revealed. But what you're going to experience from, from there forward is the kingdom of God being revealed gradually. And part of that is, I don't want to get too far off track because I think this is a this is something that needs to be fully developed and fully taught. 
But the reason it must, it the reason it does not come all at once is because it is not just about Jesus and the kingdom of God. It is also about you and me as servants of the Lord, assisting in the kingdom of God, being witnesses, bearing the testimony of Jesus in the earth, overcoming as he overcame. So it's not just Jesus doing all of the warfare and all the fighting and all the living and dying on our behalf, and we just passively receive it, but he is working to bring us into a place where we are collaborating together, cooperating together. And that's why the book of Revelation, it in the letters to the seven ecclesias, each one of those is an invitation to overcome. God wants us to join together with Christ in overcoming the adversary. They overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, having loved not their lives unto death. And they have only just begun. Jesus is doing most of the work. He sends out his apostles, the 12 apostles, gives them power over sickness and to cast out devils and to preach the good news. And they went out and returned and they saw some success. But that's that's just the beginning. And that was just in Israel. See, Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's a whole lot bigger than just saving Israel. So he's not out just to save Israel. He's out to save the whole world. For God so loved the world. Why? God so loved the world. That's why God is love. God so loved the world. And love never fails. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. And so part of this good news is that it is for everybody. That's why Paul talks about Jesus being the savior of all men, especially those who believe. So we can't uh, emphasize this. I don't think I can emphasize it enough. I don't think I can overemphasize this universal gospel, the universal message of Jesus, the Savior of all, not just the Savior of some, and God's heart and his will and his purpose to save all. So this is a spiritual revolution to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. And the cross is uh, is a foundation to the fuller expression of this kingdom of God. But that f- the fullness of that kingdom will not have been accomplished until it includes you and me and your brothers and sisters, the remnant of overcomers. Because God at any point with his great power and his great authority, he could certainly just destroy the devil, but that's that's not what he is wanting to do. That's not what he is trying to do. I mean, he could just do that whenever he wanted to. But the the issue is that he wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And maybe it would help you to understand it if I were to explain it this way. Mankind opened the door to evil and mankind has to close the door to evil. But certainly... We can't do that ourselves, and that's why Jesus became a man, became the Savior of of all people, came to seek and to save that which was lost, and then by, by overcoming death and the devil and darkness, he says that we can overcome just as he overcame, and that's the point, is to bring us along into this experience of victory, not a theoretical victory, not a theological victory, not just a victory that delivers me from my sins and sends me to heaven, ignoring the rest of the world, 
but to participate with God in this seeking and saving operation so that the whole creation that groans and travails in pain would be delivered and set free. And you and me, as kings and priests of this kingdom, are to be the ones to lead the way to this healing, this reconciliation, this restitution, so that Jesus has preeminence, beginning with us, and ultimately in all of creation. So that's what we're heading for. So in the meantime, Jesus is giving them this parable, among other things, to indicate that the fullness of this kingdom is not going to come all at once because the mission is not just to save Israel. The mission is to save the world. And in fact, Israel is unwilling to be saved and they're going to be brought into judgment. So that looks like a failure if the mission, the objective of the mission was to save Israel, then it looks like a failure. But the objective is not just to save Israel, it's to save the whole world. And so that's why, even though Israel is lost at at the moment, Paul says that by their fall, the nations are saved. And then ultimately it says that all Israel will be saved as well. It's fascinating. It's well beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but I want to give you some context for this parable here. Now, Luke's version of this parable says, being faithful in a few things now, this is the point, being faithful in a few things now in this life, in this age, in this reality, That qualifies you for ruling as a king and priest in the kingdom of God later on. Being faithful in a few things now qualifies you for ruling as a king and priest in the kingdom of God later on. And as an example, you know, that he gives this parable and the the certain nobleman. He gives each servant a sum of money. Basically, this is what happens. He gives them a sum of money. He sees whether or not they are good and faithful with what they have been given. And if they have been, then he puts them in charge over different aspects of his kingdom. This one is over 10 cities because he has proven his faithfulness. This one is over five cities because She has proven her faithfulness. But then here's this one (laughs) who is wicked and lazy and they suffer loss. And so uh, this is in keeping uh, in, in harmony with all the other parables where it's not talking about sinners versus saints. It's talking about holy and faithful and good versus hypocritical, religious and wicked. Notice how all were servants. And they all called the nobleman master. But some were good and faithful, while the other was wicked and lazy. And so they all had to bear their consequences. So remember, why is Jesus giving them this parable to let them know that faithfulness now qualifies you for fruitfulness and ruling and reward later. Faithfulness, you see, has to be measured over time. You can't look at someone in five minutes and see if they are faithful. You can't do something for for a day or so and be able to determine if you are faithful or not because faithfulness has to be measured over time because it's based on behavior. Faithfulness is not based on what you believe. Faithfulness is based on how you behave. (laughs) And all of us, not just Israel, and not just those sinners out in the world, but all of us, believers as well as unbelievers, all of us, it says, will give an account to God. Revelation twenty-two, twelve. 
where it says, I come quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give every person according to their works, according to their deeds, according to their behavior. That's the literal fulfillment of this parable that we just read. So the man goes into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom, and he comes. He, there's a long delay before he returns. And when he returns, he evaluates the faithfulness of his servants. And some were faithful and some were not faithful. And they all received a reward based on their faithfulness. That's exactly what Revelation 22.12 is telling us. Faithfulness is measured over time. It's measured over the entire course of your life. And all of us, it says, will give an account to God for the deeds that we have done in the body, the things we've done, the things we fail to do. Now, the, the idea there is not to, not to bring yourself under condemnation and start beating yourself up, but it's just to be aware that what you do matters. What you do in this life matters. It's a stewardship. You know, a, a lot of people think that so long as they're going to heaven when they die, that's really all that they're concerned about. But there's much more to our existence, even in the next age, in the kingdom age. You don't want to be left out of that because you were lazy and wicked and unfaithful to the truth that God gave you. So each one of them received something. They all received different amounts according to their ability. So God's not judging you based on comparing you to somebody else. And why didn't you do as much as this other person did? The, the judgment is based on what you have been given and how faithful you have been to be a good, faithful servant. So Jesus says, through this parable, I'm going to reward faithfulness. Faithfulness will be rewarded. I'm going to receive a kingdom and I'm going to share the fruits of that kingdom with you if you are faithful. But if you're not, then you're not going to you're not going to be able to participate and there'll be loss and so this is described different ways, weeping and gnashing of teeth, cast in the outer darkness, not invited to the wedding feast. Now, I don't want to speculate about what all of that means, and but there there is some uh, scriptural evidence, I think, that, that illustrates or at least gives us the hope that this is not for eternity. It's not that if you're not faithful in this life as a believer in Jesus that you're going to be uh, eternally damned or separated from the kingdom of God, but you're, you're, you're not going to get to participate immediately in the ruling and reigning together with him. There, there's something that you miss out on by not being faithful here in the, in the little things and the small things of this world. Now, again, some people don't care about that so long as they believe that their name is written in a book someplace and they go to heaven after they die. But I'm, I am hopeful that you and I are not content with that, but that we will press on towards the high call of God in Christ. Go beyond where we are now. Don't be content. Because eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and it has not entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. For those who are faithful in this world, faithful in this life, even faithful to lay down their life if that's what it takes, these overcomers will rule and will reign with Christ in his millennial kingdom. So this parable is intended to prepare us and to warn us and also to correct the impression 
from those that are traveling with him up to Jerusalem, that this kingdom that Jesus is talking about is about to appear. It is not for all the reasons that we have said, because it takes faithfulness has to be measured over time. And God, God is working all things together for good, according to his purpose and after the counsel of his will. So those times and seasons are are not for us to know because they are in his hands and not our hands. But the point is that we are to be faithful with all that he has given us. So then we come to Luke chapter 19 beginning in verse 28, and this takes us to the triumphal entry. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So now he has he has finally reached the outskirts of the city. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? <laughs> Where do you think you're going with my colt there? And they said, I'm paraphrasing verse 34. And they said, the Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So, uh, this is really... This is really interesting because Luke doesn't mention, he mentions the story of the cult, but he doesn't mention the prophetic significance of the cult. Why would Jesus do this? Well, and and why wouldn't Luke mention the prophecy? Well, maybe he was unfamiliar with it. You know, as a Gentile, he might not know of Zechariah 9.9 which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus did this to fulfill the scriptures. And so certainly understood what he was doing in in riding into Jerusalem on this colt. And also the disciples certainly saw the significance of it. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, no doubt, expecting a political revolution here, as well as a religious revolution. So the significance of this was not lost on the disciples in terms of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a colt. They are praising him as a king. And the significance of this is not lost on the Pharisees who called out to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. How dare they bless you as a king coming in the name of the Lord? And Jesus says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Okay, so this is referred to as the triumphal entry. 
This is uh, what most my Bible says it. Yours probably says it. The triumphal entry. Uh, but that can be a little bit misleading because Jesus is not entering the city as a conquering ruler. He's not entering the city as a king of an earthly kingdom. Later on, he would say, you are correct to Pilate. You are correct in saying that I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this earth. My kingdom is not of this world. So he's not entering the city here as a conquering ruler on a white horse with a sword coming to claim an earthly kingdom, but he is entering the city on a cult as a humble servant and a savior preparing to die for the sins of the world. And no one realized it except himself. Now, furthermore, he is not rejoicing in this triumphal entry that I think is a little bit, um, maybe it's a little bit misleading. His disciples are rejoicing, but Jesus is not rejoicing. He is weeping over the fate of the city, verse 41. So he is, he has gone up the mountain of Olivet, which is directly opposite. There's a, the brook Kidron that runs in between the Mount of Olives and the city itself. So he's gone up the mountain. He's coming down the other side. He is entering into Jerusalem now, crossing over the brook. And in verse 41, it says, As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Only the second instance in Scripture that we know of that's been recorded where Jesus wept. The first time Jesus wept, or the other time, the other instance, is John eleven thirty five the shortest verse in the Bible? It's only two words. Jesus wept, and that was at the raising of Lazarus. But he's he is weeping at their unbelief. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he says, "I am the resurrection and the life." But he he's weeping at their unbelief. Here he also weeps. He's weeping over the fate of the city and their unwillingness to believe, their unwillingness to repent, and over their future destruction, which he will expound upon more fully a couple of chapters later in Luke 21. He'll talk about that, but he already sees it. He already knows it. And he is weeping over them in verse 42, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your your children with you to the ground." And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. We'll expound upon that, as I say, more in Luke 21, and we'll see where that specifically was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. But here in in this moment, it says... Jesus declares that these things are hidden from them. They are hidden from your eyes. And Paul affirms that blindness in Romans 11.25, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so this is what we're talking about, that Israel, by rejecting Jesus, actually opened the door for the Gentiles to be saved, and then the Gentiles will provoke the Jews to jealousy, and then all of Israel will be saved. That's the mystery of God, explained in Romans 9, 10, and 11. All of these things working together for God's purpose. But wow, what a, what a difficult thing to have to endure and go through. God is... is doing 
everything possible in, in, in another, maybe it's in Matthew, where Jesus cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not allow it. And so Jesus is weeping as he enters into the city. And and for these reasons, that's why I think the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as it is so called, I don't think it's much of a triumph. I don't think he sees it as a triumph. I think he is weeping at their unbelief once more. The king finally enters the city of the great king, and they fail to recognize who he is. Well, and then in verse 45, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. They sought to destroy him. And were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So once again, you see where the conflict is coming from. It's not the chief tax collector that's giving him a problem, is it? No, it's the chief priests. See, (laughs) once again, um, there's only supposed to be one high priest. There was two high priests. So they, they perverted that. They've turned the whole temple into a business. They've institutionalized the whole thing. It's just a, it's a sham. It's a mockery. But it's not the chief tax collector that's giving Jesus the problem. It's the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people who seek to destroy him. So how does this apply to us? We can read this as a history lesson and get nothing from it, take nothing away from it, or we can understand something that I have concluded and that I've said before, that our future is revealed in Israel's past. Everything that happened to them, Scripture says, is an example for us. If we will take that example and apply it to us, how might we apply this to us if we take that to heart? Well, the ecclesia you and I are a part of, the ecclesia that Jesus is building, the body of Christ, the house of living stones. We do not have a temple like they did because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But people have created a false system of religion called Christianity, or as I like to call it, churchianity. It's an institutional counterfeit of spirit and truth. And so they have constructed for themselves a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer, institutionalizing Christianity. Back in the 300s, and it has been a den of thieves ever since, buying and selling, not just uh, tithes and offerings, but the souls of men, it talks about in the book of Revelation, a harlot church system. So here in in the beginning of the of the beginning of the end Jesus we find him entering Jerusalem weeping over it and then going into the temple to cleanse it to drive out those who were buying and selling and then he began to teach daily even as the religious leaders sought to destroy him so i believe if we take that and we apply it to us today I believe he will or is doing something similar today with us. I think just as he wept over the city then, he weeps over the ecclesia now. He weeps over the body of Christ and what we have done, how we have been seduced from the simplicity of Christ and led astray. So I think he's weeping over his people. He's calling them to come out, come out of her, my people so that you will not fall under the same judgment. 
just as he called his people to come out of Jerusalem so that they would not be destroyed along with the city. So I believe everything that happened in Israel's past is potentially going to be our future as well. So Jesus today, I believe, is weeping over the ecclesia. He is cleansing his people, cleansing his temple, purging and refining us, convicting us of sin so that we will live holy, that we would be faithful. And also, as he taught them daily, I believe that he is teaching us daily if we will listen to him. But if we seek to preserve this system of religion, then we will see Jesus as a threat and we will see any prophetic person who speaks and proclaims the mind and the will of God and the will of the Spirit, we will see them as a threat. A threat to our belief system, a threat to our church system, a threat to our ministry business So Jesus sees all of this, weeping over the ecclesia, cleansing his people, teaching them daily if we will listen to him. But as the Jews rejected Jesus then, so the religious Pharisees of today reject Jesus, quench the spirit, shut up the prophets, and have been led astray from the simplicity of Christ, just as Paul was afraid for the Corinthians I'm afraid for you that just as the serpent beguiled Eve with his subtlety, so also you would be led astray from the simplicity of Christ. And that is exactly what has happened, not necessarily to the Corinthians, but to the Christians of our generation. And as I say, that has been going on for some time, ever since Christianity became institutionalized. So now we have a religion about Jesus, but we don't have a relationship with Jesus. The work of the Lord is more important than the Lord of the work. And therefore, 1 Peter 4.17 warns us that the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. The word house there meaning the household or the family of God. See, we don't have time to judge the world and condemn the world because judgment is going to begin not out in the world, it's going to begin in the household of God, in the family of God. All of those who say, Lord, Lord, we did all of these wonderful things in your name, and he says, I don't know who you are. You have a religion about me, but you don't have a relationship with me. Depart from me, you cursed. And then faithful people, good and faithful servants, And the ones that you least expect, like Zacchaeus, of all people, who've been touched by the Lord in some way and in their their heart, and they've repented. Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Meanwhile, he's weeping over the temple and weeping over the city of the great king because they didn't recognize the time of their visitation. Zacchaeus recognized his but Jerusalem failed to recognize theirs. And so there is the lesson for you and for me. In this chapter, we see again that the humble, like Zacchaeus, will be forgiven, exalted, and saved, while the proud, wicked, and disobedient religious folks will be humiliated and cast out of this kingdom of God. Now, this was literally fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. So we're not talking about uh, any hypothetical judgment. This was literally fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, less than 40 years after Jesus wept over the city and described exactly what would happen to it. A similar thing is happening today, I believe, but it's on a much larger scale because we're not talking about one city We're talking about the world's largest religion, Christianity. Therein lies the problem with the world's largest religion. The institutional church is possessed with a Laodicean spirit 
that says we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but it does not realize that it is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that is how Jesus describes them in the book of Revelation. So Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He weeps over us and over the state of the body of Christ. He calls us to repent. But the Jews did not recognize the time of their visitation. Will we also fail to recognize ours? If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.